Hello and welcome to Reimagining the Latinx Experience in America's Book Talk series. Um, we are just going to give people about a minute or so to come into the room, and then we're going to get started on this, our final book talk on Tanya Kateri Hernandez's new book, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Black Bias and the Struggle for Equality. So we'll just give everybody a, min a minute or so to get into the room and then we'll get going. Great, so um, what I wanted to do today uh, as part of our book talk series on reimagining the Latinx experience in America is just begin by acknowledging some individuals who make it possible for us to do this. One, of course, is the University of California Irvine School of Law and our Dean Austin Parrish. Another is the American Bar Foundation and Interim Director Bryant Garth. Both have been extremely supportive of the, of the series and the overall project on the future of Latinos in the United States law opportunity and mobility. In addition, I wanted to thank the UCI Law Centers and Robbie Kadri for their support in making sure all the technical aspects of this event run smoothly, and my wonderful uh, research assistant, Elizabeth Schatz Cordero, who helps me to put the series together and, and always make sure, also works with Robbie to be sure that it runs smoothly. Now, what we'll be doing today is taking your questions through the question and answer function, and Elizabeth will be monitoring that. And she'll be posing the questions. So as you listen to what I think is going to be two wonderful presentations today, um, please feel free to just sit, send those into the Q&A function so we have them for our speakers at the end. So now to the main event, and that is our book talk, which is on uh, Racial Innocence by Tanya Cateri Hernandez. And this book is an effort to explore anti-Black bias in the Latinx community, and Professor Hernandez draws very extensively on cases in the area to make to show how in different venues she sees this dynamic in operation. And I wanted to introduce our two speakers, and then we'll let them uh, get busy with the presentations. I know they have a lot to say. Um, and uh, by the way, I am Rachel Moran. I work here at UC Irvine Law School and I oversee this event. I always forget to introduce myself. Um, now, our first speaker is Tanya Keteri Hernandez, and she is the Archibald R. Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law. And she is also an Associate Director of the Center on Race, Law, and Justice. She is a Fulbright Scholar who holds her bachelor's degree from Brown University and her law degree from Yale Law School. She is the author of several books, including this one. And just to name a couple, she is the author of Racial Subordination in Latin America, The Role of the State, Customary Law, and the New Civil Rights Response, as well as a book that I greatly enjoyed and relates to some of my own work on multiracials and civil rights, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination. And of course, today she'll be talking about her latest book on racial innocence. Now, our commentator is Professor Enid F. Trucillos Haynes, and she is a professor at the Brandeis School of Law, where she is nationally recognized for her work on immigration law. Um, she has many titles besides professor there because she's also director of the Muhammad Ali Institute for Peace and Justice. She is co-principal investigator for a 21st century research innovation grant that created a cooperative consortium for transdisciplinary social justice research. And she is co-founder and co-director of the Brandeis Human Rights Advocacy Program and was co-recipient of the 2017 Exemplary Designation Award from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Community Engagement Scholarships Awards for the work that she did as part of the Brandeis Human Rights Advocacy Program. Professor Trucios Haynes is a graduate of the Stanford Law School. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Hernandez. Thanks again for joining us. 
Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and I will try to give you a sense of the book, the arc, um, but still leave you wanting more uh, so that there's some interest in opening the book and reading it further. Um, so, you know, before the LA City Council imploded <laughs> about a month ago, uh, when I would tell people that I work on issues of anti-Blackness within the Latino community, um, I would be greeted with, well, you know, is that really a thing? Or, oh, I kind of know what you're talking about, but is it really that much of a problem, really? Uh, and you know, the attention that uh, the commentary made by Nuri Martinez and our colleagues um, certainly is given a little bit more light uh, to some of the dynamics uh, that I explore, but that isn't enough because part of the problem is the thinking that the Nuri Martinez's of the world are aberrational and that they don't represent the rest of us uh, within Latinidad. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, uh, although some friends of mine call the LA City Council my own personal publicist, um, <laughs> with the intention that they've been able to draw towards the book, um, the book is still necessary. Uh, it's not enough to just hear about one or two Nuri Martinez's. So let me again give you a little background here. Uh, in my uh, belief uh, that an important challenge uh, for racial justice that we face in our society today, but that get frequently gets overlooked, is the anti-Black bias that exists in communities themselves considered ethnic and racial minorities, like Latine ex Latine. Indeed, the conundrum of how anti-Black violence can be still so pervasive decades after the achievements of the civil rights movement cannot be readily understood nor addressed with a traditional sole focus on Anglo, white, English-speaking individuals. <laughs> in the language of the US Census Bureau, non-Hispanic whites are presently only about 57.8% of the population and declining in numbers. Granted, we need to take those numbers uh, with a grain of salt, but just using that as a mark, uh, a bookmark, uh, that decline in numbers means that the ongoing upkeep and silent acceptance of anti-Blackness implicates many other racial and ethnic groups. Exploring Latino complicity in anti-Blackness is particularly helpful. Now here, so that you don't get tired of seeing my bobblehead, I will share some slides. So let me get that up for you on the screen. Okay. Uh, as a multi-hued <laughs> ethnic group, uh, Latinos are often viewed as free of racism or at the very least free of its most exclusionary forms. Examining how anti-Blackness still does manage to manifest itself amongst the racially mixed rainbow of Latinos is a powerful illustration of how people of color themselves can fortify racism. The January 6th terrorist attack on the US Capitol included several Latino members of the white supremacist group, the Proud Boys, and their chairman, and uh, Cuban American Enrique Tarrio. Just as the white supremacist violence in Charlottesville back in 2017 also included Latino attackers. The Southern Poverty Law Center has noticed that there is an increasing trend of more Latinos joining white supremacist hate groups. The racial violence is also evident amongst white Latino law enforcement members. In cases that you may have heard about, but had no idea that there were Latinos involved. Uh, so for instance, uh, in the case of Sandra Bland uh, in Prairie View, Texas, uh, the uh, uh, police officer or state trooper uh, that was um, sort of implicated in the events that led up to her death and the uh, traffic stop uh, was a Latino, Brian Insignia. Just as, I'm gonna get my next slide up there for you, uh, the case of Filando Castile, another African-American who was murdered in Minnesota, was at the hands of a Latino police officer. And here is one you probably didn't hear very much about, excuse me, we're going a little too fast, um, of a uh, police officer in, or I should say, police chief uh, in Florida who had a campaign uh, to arrest innocent African-Americans for uh, crimes uh, that were alleged. The racial violence is also evident amongst uh, Latino opponents 
of hashtag Black Lives Matter. So rather than viewing the protesters as being in pursuit of racial justice, uh, they have been uh, perceived by many Latino as being terrorists uh, ready to, to take down the nation. And yet Latino white supremacists are not the only problem. Anti-Blackness is also manifested in Latino communities against Afro-Latinos, African-Americans, Africans, and other people of African descent in a myriad of contexts, such as the workplace, the rental and purchase of homes, educational settings, public spaces of leisure, and the criminal justice system. Examining Latino agency and anti-Blackness helps us better understand the complexities of racism and what is needed to be more effective in an increasingly racially diverse world. But before I discuss how Latino anti-Black bias surfaces in anti-discrimination law cases in the US and why I use these cases, it will be helpful, I think, if I first explain some of the backdrop uh, to Latino anti-Black bias. Over 65% of the approximately 10.7 million uh, Africans that were forcibly brought to the Americas and survived the Middle Passage uh, were taken to Latin America and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, whereas only about 3.5% were brought to what is now understood to be the United States. Today, there are approximately 150 million people of African descent in Latin America, representing about one third of the total population. However, these are considered conservative demographic figures given the histories of undercounting the number of persons of African descent on Latin American national census forms and often completely omitting a question on race or ethnicity. At the same time, persons of African descent make up more than 40% of the poor in Latin America and have been consistently marginalized and denigrated as undesirable elements of the society since the abolition of slavery across Las Americas. Yet the view that racism does not exist is pervasive in Latin America, despite the advent of social justice movements and social science researchers demonstrating the contrary. So for example, when the British Broadcasting System, uh, the BBC, surveyed Latin Americans regarding the existence of racism, a significant number of respondents emphatically denied uh, that to be the case. Many, for instance, made statements such as, we are not racist, our region is not racist, for the simple fact that the majority of the population is racially mixed. Thus, the denial of racism is rooted in what many scholars have critiqued as the myth of racial democracy. The notion that racial mixture, mestizaje, in a population is emblematic of racial harmony and insulated from racial discord and inequality. Academic scholarship in the last 20 years has critiqued the Latin American mestizaje theories of racial mixture as emblematic of racial harmony. Yet Latin Americans still very much adhere to the notion that on the ground, uh, that racial mixture and the absence of Jim Crow racial segregation are such a marked contrast to the US racial history that the region views itself as what I term racially innocent. In part, the absence of a legal critique of the Latin American strategic comparisons to the Jim Crow US has enabled the Latin American racial innocence stance to remain. My earlier book on racial subordination in Latin America uh, provides the legal critique. Specifically, the book is about the ways in which the Latin American denial of racism operating in conjunction with the notion that true racism can only be found in the racial segregation of the US veils the actual manifestations of racism in Latin America. The book argues that an examination of the role of the state after the abolition of slavery in regulating race through immigration law and customary law disrupts this picture of Latin America as racially innocent, excuse me. The book assesses the ways in which the contemporary Latin American anti-discrimination laws seek to eradicate the legacy of racial inequality wrought by the historic racism of the state. All of which is to say that the legacy of slavery is just as relevant to the Latin American context as it is to the US context. So when people from Latin America and the Caribbean migrate to the US and pass on their cultural attitudes cross generations in the US, 
they bring along their racialized baggage with them and transmit it into US Latino culture. This is what the current book, the sequel, if you will, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Black Bias is all about. It examines how anti-Black racism that arises outside of the unfortunately familiar US frame of Anglo white versus Black bias can be mystifying for many people. This is in part because US Blackness is primarily conceived of as embodied by, solely by English speaking African Americans. In turn, anti-Blackness is popularly understood as a uniquely US phenomena affecting those English speaking African Americans with occasional recognition of the racialized struggles of Africans and others in the African diaspora. Civil rights leaders are also seemingly reticent to air the dirty laundry of the bias that exists within communities of color, lest it distract from what they view to be the real racism of white supremacy. However, all the while, Afro-Latinos and African-Americans and others suffer from acts of discrimination at the hands of Latinos who claim that their racially mixed cultures immunize them from being racist. This is what I term the Latino racial innocence cloak that veils Latino complicity in US racism. In turn, the public ignorance about Latino anti-Blackness undermines the ability to fully address the interwoven complexities of US racism in developing public policies and more importantly, in my view, enforcing anti-discrimination law. Judges and the rest of society need to learn that Latinos can be racist too. My objective is to aid those who care about the pursuit of equality by providing a more expansive view of the greater swath of the population that is harmed by anti-Blackness and how. I focus on how anti-Blackness is manifested in Latino communities against Afro-Latinos, African-Americans and other people of African descent in a myriad of contexts, such as the workplace, the rental and purchase of homes, educational settings, public spaces of leisure and the criminal justice system. By contributing the missing piece of Latino agency to an understanding of the complexities of racism, social justice actors will be better positioned to be more effective in an increasingly racially diverse world. I do this by excavating the otherwise silenced voices of the Afro-Latino and African-American victims of Latino anti-Blackness from the case files of discrimination charges. In examining how discrimination claims of Latino anti-Blackness arise, two central patterns become evident. First, Latino anti-Blackness is more prevalent and serious in its consequences than many commentators in politics and the media care to admit. Second, the ability to identify and address Latino anti-Blackness is hampered by the notion that Latinos cannot be prejudiced or racist simply by virtue of being Latino. It's for this reason that the tales of Latino anti-Black discrimination recounted in court cases are so important in as much as they help to disrupt the Latino myth of racial innocence and clarify Latino agency in racism. Or as my children say, I'm bringing the receipts. <laughs> the interrogation of the Latinos can't be prejudiced defense to racism is especially illuminating for the legal enforcement of anti-discrimination law. For instance, when Eddie Frazier, an African-American man wanted to rent an apartment in the suburban Long Island community of Smithtown, New York, it was a Latino homeowner who refused to rent him and consider his application. The Latino landlord instead chose to wait three more months for a non-Black applicant to surface. Yet a jury was persuaded that no racial discrimination had occurred due to the fact that the owner was a Brazilian who denied harboring racial bias because she was of mixed race heritage and numerous of her Brazilian relatives had black and Indian ancestry. Juries though are not alone in being misled about Latino agency in racism. The case of Maxine Sprott is illustrative. Maxine, an African-American woman, who worked as a deputy director of the New York City Housing Authority's Office of Equal Opportunity, 
those are the projects we call NYCHA, <laughs> alleged that her Hispanic supervisor office director, Rosalind Reyes, harassed her with derogatory comments about her work performance. Each work performance evaluation that was positive was always followed from Director Reyes with negative commentary about Maxine's presumably lack of leadership skills in her role as deputy director. She also harassed her about her timesheets and excluded her from various office functions and meetings. When Maxine could no longer withstand the onslaught of harassment, she filed the claim of discrimination with the general manager of NYCHA. Exactly three days after Maxine files the claim, Director Reyes then submits a retaliatory performance evaluation that for the first time rated Maxine as marginal. And as a result, she was denied a merit salary increase. It was then another Latino, NYCHA official, Chairman Ruben Franco, who informs Maxine that she was not going to be transferred from her uh, well-furnished private office into a cubicle for a new position where her material responsibilities would be diminished. Only when Maxine filed suit in court was she able to reach a settlement agreement with NYCHA and receive financial compensation. Now, while any number of concerns may have influenced Maxine and her attorney to settle the case rather than move forward with a jury trial, one contributing factor could very well have been the great significance the judge placed upon office racial diversity as mitigating claims of discrimination. For the judge, it was immaterial that when Chairman Franco transferred Maxine to an effectively lesser position in a cubicle at the same time as two other African-American female employees were being terminated, all as part of Chairman Franco's uh, ostensible reorganization plan, that this was a failure to raise an inference of discrimination because as the judge says in the opinion, the new director is a Hispanic woman. The remaining staff include 24 Hispanics, 23 African-Americans. Thus, the Georgia accorded a Latino dominant workplace and the supervisor's Hispanic uh, status, great power to circumvent racism. Here and then is the judicial presumption that Latino coworkers cannot be bearers of racism. A corollary of the judicial presumption that Latino coworkers cannot be bearers of racism is the judicial notion that all Latino places of origin are racial equivalents. The case of Arrocha versus CUNY provides a useful illustration. Jose, a self-identified Afro-Panamanian tutor of Spanish, sued his university employer for failure to renew his appointment as an adjunct instructor. Jose alleged that the Latinos who directed the department where he worked uh, had a disturbing culture of favoritism that favored the appointments of white Cubans, Spaniards, and white Hispanics from South America. Yet the court dismissed his claims because there was not an understanding of the ways in which a color hierarchy informs how Latinos experience racism and a national origin bias from other Latinos who are not a harmonious, homogeneous pan-ethnic grouping. The dismissal of the case was, ju was uh, justified by the judge based on the fact that five of the eight adjunct instructors that were reappointed instead of Jose were natives of other South or Central American countries, such as Argentina, Peru, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. The judge explicitly stated in the opinion that Quote, diversity in an employer's staff undercuts an inference of discriminatory intent, which is not the actual law from statute or established case law. Instead, the judge intuited and inferred non-discrimination from the presumption that Latino ethnic subgroups are interchangeable and homogeneous. This perspective fails to appreciate the ways in which internal Latino national origin bias is rooted in a racialized hierarchy of Latin American countries, where countries perceived or touted as European are viewed as more advanced than those more significantly populated with people of indigenous descent or African descent. Thus, in the list of countries the judge found as equivalents indicating the absence of national origin bias, Latin American racial constructs would rank Argentina as a highly valued white country, followed by Peru and Mexico, with its indigenous population and the most derided 
would be the Dominican Republic and the plaintiff's own country of origin, Panama, because of their dominance by African descended peoples. For Latinos, influenced by Latin American racial paradigms, where each country has a racial identification, a diverse workforce of Latinos is not the immediate equivalent of a bias-free context, nor is a color preference divorced from a racialized ideology within the Latino context. However, Latino anti-Black bias shows up not only as an expression of individual racial attitudes, but also in systemic structures of intentional exclusion. For instance, in the case of Hunt versus Personal Staffing Group, Latino employees of a Chicago-based nationwide job placement agency described how their Latino supervisors trained them to exclude African-American applicants from job placements in favor of Latino applicants. They were instructed to automatically reject African-Americans because of the stereotype that they were not capable of working as hard as Latinos. The lawsuit details how dispatchers who nevertheless sent African-American job seekers to a company would later be reprimanded by their Latino bosses for doing so and threatened with termination. The placement agency would start the day by separating out Hispanic job applicants from African-Americans. They would enter the Hispanic applicants' contact information into a database so they could be easily reached when jobs opened up. African-American applicants rarely received the same treatment. Instead, they were instructed to go to an office at dawn to wait for assignments that rarely ever came. One dispatcher testified that if it was 10, I'm quoting here, if it was 10 Mexicans that would come at 1.30 p.m. and 25 African-Americans that were there at 4.30 a.m., and were waiting to be sent to work, they would send the Mexicans first. This Latino-run employment agency effectively ensured a secondary racial caste system of Latinos over Blacks in the already segregated Chicago area labor market that privileges Anglo, Anglo whiteness. So to wrap up, I'd like to address a concern I often hear that people of color cannot be racist because they don't have power. When Latinos and other people of color for that matter are active participants in the denial of access to an important life opportunity, a home, a job, an unimpeded education, fairness in the criminal justice system and entrance into public spaces, all based on race, they are no longer just passive holders of an anti-Black cultural prejudice. They are part of the problem of racism. Certainly none of the victims of anti-Black bias in the narratives of discrimination I examine in my research would be placated with the disclaimer, your experience is not an example of racism because Latinos don't have the systemic power to be racist in white Anglo-created structures. One can immediately envision such a victim replying, oh yeah, that so-called non-racist Latino is the one who excluded me, subordinated me, oppressed me for being Black. A Latino claim of racial innocence in the racist world white Anglos created in the U.S. is a thin moral, I should say a thin read of moral superiority when the Latino hand is the one forcefully slamming the door to black inclusion. So my book project here is more than just a call for recognizing that Latinos can be prejudiced too. Rather, it's an entreaty for all future interventions into matters of racism to critically engage how Latinos and many others collaborate and sustain structures of racism. By recognizing that they're part of the problem, interventions can also address them as part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Judges and juries can be taught to desist from being distracted by the, I can't be racist, I'm Latino, pseudo defense to accusations of discrimination. In short, dismantling racism in the US requires that every component of its structures be taken apart, even the ones articulated in Spanish. We do this by becoming racially literate about Latino anti-Blackness and engaging in meaningful coalition work. Some examples exist in Los Angeles, as well as in Boston and across the nation, but these are examples of institutions that work on dealing with the intra hierarchies as well as the cross group hierarchies. Let me shut down here the screen share so that I can see the 
Enid's beautiful face as she gives me her feedback. And we open it up for a conversation. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya, for what I would, this serious and important work, um, accounting for white privilege in the Latino community, Latinx community, and um, the bias and exclusion and violence that's born of Latinx anti-Blackness. It really is a chilling account that can't be ignored. And I appreciate how the book is designed to reach a wide audience and have an impact. It's readable and the stories, mixing stories and news and, and many different sources and um, thoroughly documented in the footnotes, of course. But I, it is the combination that I find so powerful, the documentation of anti-Blackness across all aspects of our society is powerful, both in the specific ways that Afro and Latinx people are discriminated and oppressed, but also connecting that to the broader discrimination against Black Americans and Black immigrants in, in this country and throughout Latin America. And I think naming Latino, Latinx, white privilege is really important. And, um, and using those terms, I think our community avoids, uh, as you point out so well in the group, in the book, um, there's this elitism and social distancing from blackness that occurs throughout Latin America and here in the United States. And, and the idea of challenging whether um, people, Latinx people can be racist. Um, one only has to look at the composition and the stratification in Latin America, and you see it happening here um, in the United States. And I really appreciate how you document the wide, the number of vehicles, the wide array of places where this occurs, starting with families and how families themselves um, adopt this anti-Blackness against members, their siblings, their aunts, their uncles, their parents, uh, and how traumatic that can be. And, um, and you talk about this at the end of the book, and I thoroughly appreciate it, um, your own experience. And I will say my experience is that we never talked about race, but it was so clear that our family was Black, and how can we not? And so as a child, I was left to pull all of the happenings, the things that were happening in my family, and try to make sense of them. And it's only as I got older that I could really understand. I had the language to put it all together. And I, it's a disservice to our children who live in a world where um, systemic racism exists if they are not prepared to live in the world and understand, I think, um, one of the, the impacts. But, um, and I, I liked how you talked about the active and uh, passive participation. And when um, white Latinos and other Lat members of the Latinx community uh, actively participate in the systems of white supremacy and systemic racism, then that converts whatever passive uh, anti-Blackness they might have, uh, which I believe is the beginning of what becomes, right, the, the active, as you point out in the book, the active uh, anti-Blackness. And the fact that it comes from Latin America, as well as from our own homes, whether we are tied, have connections and ties to our home countries or not. So it's here. Um, and I, I love how the book also taught, demonstrates the power of language, what it means to be oppressed in Spanish and English by people, right? And to hear uh, racially derogatory terms in Spanish and be called the N-word, you know, there, there's a power in that, um, that form of oppression that using both languages that I think is, um, is something that you demonstrate well. And, and I think, you know, we don't really think about it in the larger community and, and certainly outside of our community, I don't think people really know all of that. Um, so the power of language I thought was really important as you emphasized, and as well how there are, um, I, the term you used, I think that separate Latinx hiring networks, right? For small business owners who discriminate against Afro-Latinx um, members of our community and um, indigenous members of our community, I would add, I'm sure. And, how that's hidden. No one would know that because it's all within the community. And so it goes unnoticed, undocumented. And, um, and it's a really important insight about that hidden aspect of oppression that happens within our community. And, um, and of course, the limits of anti-discrimination law in recognizing the, the uh, racism and privilege that exists within our own community. 
And what I found really persuasive also is your discussion about the importance of the census data and how um, efforts to have a Latino racial identity box would then limit our ability to actually account for the discrimination and the experiences of Afro-Latinx people. And so we need to have um, the, the ethnicity separate from the racial identifier. And, and how you demonstrated, you talked in the book about how uh, I think it was like 24% of people identify their Afro uh, descendancy heritage when the question was phrased differently. But if phrased as black or, or Latino, then people are not going to identify their black heritage. And so that is significant. Um, and I will say that I learned uh, when I first read those statistics about how many Latinx folks were um, identifying as some other race and the number moved like 30%, uh, 30 percentage points. I, I thought that meant that there was an affirmative multiracial identification, but instead, as your book demonstrates, it was the Census Bureau accounting for someone naming their country of origin and identifying as Latinx and to the Census Bureau itself was deciding that that was multiracial, um, more than one race. So what I, I thought might be hopeful <laughs> turned out not to be uh, not to be from the data. And so I appreciate learning that. Um, and and I, what I also appreciated was how you contextualize so many incidents of violence. And you brought up Sandra Bland, uh, Philando Castile, um, Trayvon Martin, uh, murder by George Zimmerman. It, it's, uh, I'm sure like many other members of our community, you know, sometimes you see things happening and you're like, oh gosh, I hope it's not us who are attacking, you know, one of my community attacking another community of color or anyone. Um, and too often it has been. And I think your book helps us understand that, right? Puts it in a framework that, that the public can really grapple with those incidents that's real, that's part of our community, because it's part of our community. That's essentially what we're talking about, that this, that anti-Blackness is part of our communities. It's in our families, as we, as you ably demonstrate. And um, finally, or maybe second to last, the, the idea of what does this mean for the future, thinking about voting rights, it was really disheartening to see that the idea of unity mapping and having um, Latinx and Black communities come together to identify common interests and concerns was stymied by anti-Blackness in the Latinx community. It is disheartening. And um, I hope that your book, I think it can be a way for people to really see how that happens and, and, and perhaps reevaluate their own anti-Blackness because it, the book is a call for systemic um, understanding and analysis, but also an understanding of how we as individuals are participating, right? How are we engaging in anti-Blackness um, which any of us can engage in, and there is no exemption of being a member of the particular group of being Latinx that makes you and makes any of us inherently unbiased, lacking prejudice, not anti-black. And um, and and your book also talks a little bit about how vociferously members of our community um, will refuse to acknowledge that. And I have had those conversations with people where it. And it was almost mystifying to me not to recognize the clear hierarchies that exist in Latin America, in the United States, in our communities. Um, but it is a, there is a serious investment in that white privilege. And um, those are tough conversations. I, I, I really enjoyed the book. I believe it's a really wonderful way to, to raise the issue that I think the, pop, the public and, and can be part of popular discourse and you weave in the cases to really make it as strong as possible and cut across so many different areas of our society. So uh, I really appreciated reading the book. And I will just say um, one thing about from your, the last chapter about your personal experiences. I cut off my hair when I was a, a, a teenager, refusing to do the wash and set every Sunday and have, trying to make my hair look straight, which it never could really. And so, um, it, these issues are, are found in all in so many of our families. And I appreciate that you brought this to the fore and shared your personal story and pulled together such a wealth of data to make it um, absolutely crystal clear that this that we need to deal with white privilege in our community. And as my students, I have one question I thought I'd ask you since 
Yeah, that's my commentary. And, and to have a bit of a dialogue, I see among um, younger um, white and uh, Lat Lat Latinx students and other Latinx students, this idea, they talk about this idea of white passing. They seem to be more um, aware. Now, of course, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. We have a very small, close-knit Latinx community and a much smaller progressive feminist Latinx community beyond that. And so I live in this rarefied, very privileged little world um, where we do um, center Afro-Latinx experiences, um, indigenous experiences in our work. I work with this nonprofit, but I do see it among my younger students as well, that they are appear to be more um, aware of white privilege and certainly anti-Blackness. I wonder whether that translates to, to anti-Blackness within our Latinx community. That's that's the, uh, what I'm not so sure about. But I wonder if you've had that experience and do you think that perhaps as younger uh, Latinx folks start voting and, and uh, become more vocal and the leaders in our community, if you see anything changing there? Well, thank you very much for the comments and uh, just, I wanted to let Professor Hernandez respond, but I also wanted to urge you in the audience to submit your questions to the Q&A function so that we can hear from you as well. Okay, uh, so while people uh, get their thoughts together um, and, and articulate their questions, I know I've, we've thrown a lot at you, so it can be a lot to process. Um, I will say that I often get that question, you know, like, you know, isn't it fantastic the way in which we see many more uh, one Afro-Latino youth speaking and, and finding space for themselves? For a while, it was on Twitter. Let's see where else it happens. Um, <laughs> Whether we all just flow to Instagram or what have you. Um, but there are more of these spaces, more of these conversations. Um, but I always like to um, just caution people with regards to this um, hope, right, that everything gets resolved with generational transfer. Right? Um, and the reason for that is that social justice is something you have to actively seek and work on, right? It's just not something that you know, one just intuits um, and, and falls into. Um, and so when I look at, for instance, the um, dynamics of internet dating, right? Which, you know, is primarily a youthful thing, though not exclusively. Um, but when you look at the, the data on internet dating and racial preferencing, you know, it's astounding the num the degree to which Lat those who are c categorized as Latino, and there's no racial, there's no intersectional examination in the data, unfortunately, of the Latino identity. Uh, so just Latinos as a group um, are sort of way up there <laughs> in their numbers. Uh, when I say way up there, meaning they parallel white Anglo numbers of excluding black dating options. These, the, the, this is a young person dynamic, not just a, oh, it's my abuelita, oh, it's my grandparents, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and here I just want to sort of underscore sort of some of the problem with not having intersectional data, such as like, you know, the census could uh, uh, enable. Imagine what those numbers of Latino exclusion of Black internet dating options would be like if we were able to peel out the numbers of Latinos who identify as Afro themselves. Not to say they can't be just as racist, right? You know, and, and want to exclude um, Black daters. But, you know, intuitively, we I think we can agree like that those numbers are probably less in degree. So if we were able to peel them out with an intersectional examination of the data, consider how much more extreme, right? That Latino rejection, that young person Latino rejection right, of black daters uh, might very well reveal. Uh, and so I, I guess what I say, a long-winded answer, but uh, what I, where I land on this issue of sort of um, generational transfer is that we at a crossroads, right? We have an opportunity here right, um, to you know, have the racial reckoning in our country also combine with the greater space being attended to Afro-Latino voices and perspectives. Um, but it's a moment, right? It's an opportunity that we could let go by or we can take advantage of. And I'm not certain necessarily, you know, we, we don't have either way guaranteed to us, I guess is, is how I would put it, that it, it takes work. Um, and that's why I view the book as not just sort of the scholarly exploration, um, but also I hope uh, an aid in the, you know, 
broad base encompassing um, desire for multiracial, for pursuing or multiracial democracy um, and having um, true racial equality, right? You know, that's something that we all have to kind of join together in doing. Um, and that has to be done by in increasing and enhancing our racial literacy. You know, so much of what I described, you know, here in just like, you know, the, the brief um, pricey to the book and um, in greater detail in the book itself um, are the costs of racial literacy. You know, not, the judge is not, not understanding that, um, you know, how Latino anti-Blackness manifests itself. Juries not being provided any expert witness testimony about it to sort of be able, for them to be able to situate what they're seeing and understanding it um, as a form of anti-Blackness. Um, this isn't necessarily about the inadequacy of law, so that's another conversation we could have, right? But it's about just the law as it exists being under enforced because of racial illiteracy about how Latinos are also racially informed and thus actors, not merely victims. Um, I guess that was more than you put it there on the table for me, Ina, but once you get me started, um, <laughs> it's hard for me to shut down. And I'm not sure if there are questions in the Q&A. Oh, there are. Okay, yes. so I'll we have a couple. I can read the first one for you. Um, what are the beginning steps to start the conversation with family members to bring up this hidden concept where they don't identify this being a problem? Instead, they see it as part of their culture and they aren't racist. It's just teasing or something similar. I mean, I think a way into this question is um, with a response to the um, concern I often hear um, when I, I uh, talk about this, you know, before Latino communities, um, and that's all. Oh, but you know, when we say when we 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 we're not racist because when we 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 call people with words of affection by their blackness, right? We say mi negrito, mi negrita, and we mean it with love. Right? Um, and here's the thing: that could very well be, you know, that you're saying it with love, but you need to step back for a moment and ask yourself. Why is it necessary to reference that person's blackness at all? Right? We don't say me blanquito. We don't say my little black person in order to uh, accord affection. Right? That would be viewed as somewhat odd. But we don't view as odd at all this um, box in of a person, however lovely, you know, however affectionately done um, by their blackness. Right? I mean, in some respects, when you put that into context with the paternalism of slavery's past, um, it no longer seems so benign, however unconscious. Right? So, you know, that's one thing I like to lay it on the table. The other thing, too, is that there's a way in which these terms of affection uh, that are racialized are very much about containing blackness by making it be appropriated. N not in the cultural appropriation um, uh, framing of this. What I mean by that is blackness can be okay as long as you're my black, me negrito, right? Blackness can be okay if, um, if many of the phrases that we have, you know, so-and-so is black, but good looking. So-and-so is black, but so well-groomed. Right? You know, there's a way in which we need to tame and justify blackness in order to make it acceptable right? um, or to consume it and you know, make it ours. And then it's okay because it's not like the rest of regular blackness, which is problematic. Right? Once you provide a landscape for um, sort of how we animate right, our cultural uh, racial notions, then it's easier to start moving forward with this conversation. So short, a shorter answer to this question, right? You know, how do we start with doing this within our families? Well, two things. One, it can't only be about our family comment conversations, though I understand why for so many uh, Latine and Latinx that that feels very urgent and primary, because it's like, as I say in the book, where, you know, family is the scene of the crime, right? You know, that's where so much trauma happens um, and where we witness so much. Um, but the reason why I say I can't just stop at the family, although using the book can be helpful, right? Why? Because what the book does is it provides a context and, and the patterns for and the harms, right? It's very easy to say this is not harmful. We're not listening to the victims. <laughs> just be perfectly frank. Right? Um, when you can just sort of abstract it away right? as being just about your own intentionality as opposed to how group-based problems are occurring. 
So the book hopefully can be helpful in that way. Um, but if we live it, leave it with just an idea about how do I talk to my families and using the book to how do I talk to my families, we're forgetting how systemic this is. And, you know, critical race theory is always working both angles of these things, right? Um, and so the uh, importance is also in thinking through how do we um, account for the pigmentocracy within our Latino organizations? Who gets to count as a leader? often, you know, more often than not, right? It's not just a gender issue, right? Though it's that. It's also a race issue. Uh, it's also it's not also not just a skin color issue that I put that out there as, you know, this idea of a pigmentocracy, um, because colorism hides too much of what race does, meaning the colorism seems to get uh, sort of demoted to this idea of, oh, it's just about, about people's preferences, um, as far as beauty is concerned, it becomes like an aesthetic, um, as opposed to acknowledging how even where someone is not dark skinned, uh, you know, we have a whole nomenclature in Spanish <laughs> for demarcating people's racialized features um, that encompasses not just skin color, you can be pale as can be, but if your hair texture is a particular kind, if your nose is a certain breadth, your lips are a certain thickness, we got a word for you. And it ain't a good one, right? <laughs> um, and so that's not about color. That's about racism, right? Or I should say that's about racialization, right? That's about racialization. So um, uh, yes, start with the family. Yes, use the book as a way of to contextualize the voices of the, of the victims um, in order for the um, systemic to come through and for families to start to see that this is not about us policing their language. Because I know there can be resistance that don't say this, don't say that. Right? I guess some of that myself from my own children. Um, but it's not just about policing language. It's about how do we really want our Latinidad to be manifested? Do we want it to be with racial hierarchy? Or do we want to, you know, really enact a Simón Bolívar, a dream of all of us unified together? Um, that has to happen by us being honest right? and recognizing the racialized dynamics that we have been part of and then coming together to actually do something about it. I wanted to let uh, Professor Trucios Haynes weigh in if she wants, because I know you also mentioned the family dynamic. Well, I couldn't agree more with what everything that uh, Professor um, Tanya Kateri Hernandez said. And um, so I would say the same thing about uh, dealing with outside of the family and inside of the family. And the, those can be challenging discussions. And I think sometimes the focus on um, how, as the book demonstrates, anti-Blackness has made a difference in the material outcomes of people's lives. And we can see that, all of us can see that and how that is tied and linked back to that anti-Blackness bias that um, you know, permeates and is reflected in the larger society. And so sometimes making those concrete connections, I think, and the book does that really well, so, yeah. I think we have another question. Um, yeah, so the next question is, how does the worldwide influence of US movies and television shows that cast black people in negative roles affect anti-black bias in Latin American countries? Ah, I mean, you know, media is, um, and, and Hollywood are certainly um, part and parcel right, of, of, of um, creating a public discourse uh, that is impoverished. But, you know, we don't need to just start there. We can look at Latino, Latin American media outlets. I mean, you know, take a look at Univision and Telemundo, um, and you don't need to go to Hollywood. You can see the ways in which there is a very narrow space uh, in which uh, Afro Latinidad can exist. Um, it's uh, as the cleaning staff, as the witches, um, and what have you, it's not as the protagonist, it's not as the love interest, right? Those are exceptionally rare uh, instances. And when they do uh, get onto the screen, it's in a very exoticized and stereotyped manner, right? It's always like, oh, she can dance so well, <laughs> you know? Um, as if, you know, all Afro Latinos have some kind of rhythm, you know, plenty of us don't know how to do, dance at all. Anyway, um, so yes, you know, anti-Black, uh, let me step back for a moment. Anti-Blackness is a global phenomenon. 
The book is not at all uh, trying to suggest that this is only about Latinos or that Latinos are the only problem. But what I'm trying to do is to insert Latinos into the conversation of the globality of anti-Blackness. Because otherwise, what, what do we have? This is, sort of, this is the sneaking trend that I'm seeing in these cases of anti-discrimination law in the United States is this idea of, oh, the browning of America means anti-discrimination law has no more role, right? Because if we only view it as this is about making sure we police white Anglos in what they do in uh, uh, racial exclusion and only them, then we leave a growing multiracial world in, La in the United States and many other places as well right? um, without adequate recourse. Right? It, 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 the, the, the law becomes dead letter. You know, the, I guess another way for me to say is my book is not a law reform project in the typical sense, meaning, um, oh, I'm here to tell you that uh, Title VII is missing this or that, um, or I've got a new, uh, you know, uh, law that I would like to create or, or a new theoretical concept um, for thinking about these things. I'm not that fancy. <laughs> um, instead, what this book is about is about trying to call to sort of retune right um, the insights about uh, anti-discrimination law as being applicable, meaning that Latinos are not only victims, but can also be agents in issues of discrimination, and law needs to be able to assess those claims. I'm not saying every claim that files is a meritorious one, but to not even inquire, that's problematic. And to view any um, signs that a Latino would say, oh, this is a problem here, as sort of not counting because it's in Spanish, that's a problem. One more thing I think I want to add here, and Enid, you can circle back, back, back in on this if you like. When you talked about or reflected sort of the importance of language, um, there was a choice that I made in the book, and I don't know if you, you, were, you were picking up on this as well, is that in telling people stories, you know, I wanted to be as accurate as possible and use their words where I could, et cetera. But after a while of uh, writing the book, it became so overwhelming to constantly hear the N-word in Spanish and in English in each of these accounts um, that I thought to myself, if it's traumatic for me, what would this be like for a reader to constantly be accosted by this in the book? Um, and, you know, as many people, readers tell me it's a fast read. And so like, you know, if you're consuming this, and you're just, so I thought to myself, that's like another racial trauma. Um, so instead, I made a decision that in the print version that I would just sort of start, start with the letter N and then dash, 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 then R and saying, you know, in Spanish. Um, for the audio book, I then had an interesting moment. Um, I was very fortunate to find an LA-based audio book narrator who was Afro-Boricua herself. <laughs> I had to find her. <laughs> and um, her name's Anmari Guerra, in case anybody's out there looking for um, a good audio book narrator. Um, she uh, and I had a conversation, you know, like, how do you want to handle this, you know, and we talked it out together and we decided, you know, you can't just so and dash, 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 that's too cumbersome for an audio. And so there in the audio book, you know, it gets translated as like the N word, which is inadequate and it becomes a little bit sort of too de-emphasized. Um, but sometimes you make compromises depending on the medium, right? you know, that something is being communicated in. Um, but okay, uh, enough said about that. Well, I wanted to say the hour has flown by. I can't believe it's already time for us to close, but I wanted to thank everyone who joined us today. I wanted to especially thank Professor Hernandez, Professor Trucillos Haynes, Professor Hernandez for the wonderful new book and her scintillating commentary, and Professor Trucillos Haynes for her insightful reflections on the book. Uh, we This is the last talk of the uh, fall series, but I hope you'll join us and keep your eye out for our spring schedule, which we're currently working to finalize. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. Thank you so much for inviting me to both Rachel and Tanya. I really appreciate it. It's great to be part of this conversation.